Uh, just before we get started with part two, who was here last week that can give just a couple of quick points from last week that we spoke about uh, in part one? Does anyone remember what we spoke about last week? You guys are amazing. You're remembering. You're going through and trying to remember. You're trying to remember if you were here. You were here last week. I remember that. All right. Well, we'll get started. I, oh, you remember? It was the joy of knowing. Excellent. Very good. For those who did not hear, Nermeen said that last week we were discussing how true Christianity is walking with Christ. It's knowing Christ. And if we're not doing that, no matter how much, how many Christian things we do, that is, in fact, not Christianity. Okay? Uh, we also spoke, if I can remind you, we said last week, we said that there's this connection between joy, the word joy in Greek, and the word grace in Greek and the word thanksgiving in Greek. And we said Greece, grace is the word charis, right? That's the, um, the work of God in our lives that we encounter. And joy comes as a response to that. I will not say the word because that threw some of you off last week. And then the um, other word was thanksgiving, which is evcharis theia. And um, that is the outward expression of uh, the response to grace. All right. uh, let's jump in right away with um, today's talk. Name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. So, so last week, we opened up this series, said that there is a joy of knowing Christ, that, that there is no greater joy. And St. Paul, if you recall, he said that he would consider all things rubbish for the gift of knowing Jesus Christ. Not knowing about him, but knowing him personally. And so today I want to speak a little bit about the joy in knowing Christ's work and how it is that we can rejoice in the work of Christ, what it is that he has done, what it is that Jesus has fulfilled on our behalf and for the sake of all humanity. The central theme of the Christian life is joy in Christ. And knowing him, we said, surpasses all pursuits and possessions. Nothing compares to the gift of knowing our good Savior, Jesus. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the source of joy and life and hope. And without him, our lives will feel empty and meaningless. Um, and with him, they will feel like they are overflowing. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. I'm trying really hard to not react to those sneezes, by the way. It's getting better. Thank you for muffling it back there for us. I appreciate it. I'm still recovering from a whiplash I got um, the first time I heard it. Physical therapy has been expensive. I'll send you the bill, Mark. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 18 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and that in all things he may have the preeminence. Everything that we do in church, in life, in work, is so that Christ can have the place of honor, that he has the preeminence. And so what I'd like to look at, do today, is take a snapshot of the work of Christ so that we can rejoice in him. Rejoice in what it is that he has done for you and for us. 
We're going to begin by talking about Christ's work through the incarnation. In John chapter 1, verse 14, it says that the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. We beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The first place that we begin is by rejoicing in the work of Christ entering into this world. That he bridged that chasm that no longer is God far from us, but truly he has never been ever closer. He entered into our world and walked amongst us. We want to consider the humility and the obedience of Jesus in what he has done by not only entering this world, but taking on the cross. And as St. Paul reminds us, that he became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. What a joy that Christ has embraced that and accepted that for your sake, for my sake. How beautiful is his love. How unfathomable is his goodness that he would accept that for us we could pause each day and think about God's presence amongst us, that that is possible, not just because he sits in heaven, but because he has entered into this world. He has united himself to us. And he walked amongst us and became like us in all things, yet without sin. Consider the significance of what it is that he did by the word that St. Paul uses, recapitulating all things to himself. He brought all of humanity into himself through the incarnation. And it's for that reason we can be saved. It's not just because of what he did on the cross. It's because who he is makes the cross of efficacy. It makes it of power in our lives. Christ, who is the word of God, the perfect image of the Father, returns to have his portrait his image, restored, redrawn, renewed. He doesn't come to commission a new drawing, a new piece of work, but he wanted to renovate the original. Think about that, guys. Salvation is not God taking us out of this world, but it's him entering into this world to save us, to make meaning and sense and purpose of the lives that we live. And so we can rejoice in who he is, as the incarnate word. We, of course, rejoice in the work of Christ on the cross. St. Peter says that who himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. When we speak about the atoning work of Jesus Christ, there's two dimensions to atonement. The first one is that he has wiped away the sin that we would be forgiven. The second one, as one theologian suggested, he said, atonement is making us at one, at one mint with God. That the atoning work of Christ began in his incarnation but was perfected on the cross. He washes over, he covers our sin. And guys, how beautiful it is that we can stand before God and speak to him as one having been washed, one having been forgiven. Consider the forgiveness and healing that you have that's found in the cross. I don't know how much Actually, I do know to a degree how much people are burdened by their sin. Feeling unforgiven, feeling broken. Feeling a life of shame for that which they have done. But how much joy we should have in the work that Christ has done for us on the cross. That when he looks at us, he says, you are forgiven. What a joy that is. What a joy that that should, that should never become an ordinary act that he has done. An ordinary work that he has done for us. That he calls us, declares us, and makes us forgiven because of his work 
on the cross? And what about his work of conquering death? The final enemy. He has victory over the worst and final death um, enemy that terrified humanity since the beginning. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 22, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so Christ, in Christ all shall be made alive. It's interesting, in that same chapter, St. Paul talks about how he rose from the dead according to the scriptures. So this week I was kind of like wrestling with this. Which scripture was it talking about that he rose from the dead? You notice the language that he uses here. He talks about the first fruits, right? And he talks about the fruit that comes forth from Adam and the fruit that comes forth from Christ, the second Adam. The, the passage that I believe he's pointing to is way back on day three. Remember, Christ rose on the third day, day three of creation. What happened on day three of creation? Let's open up and take a peek. Day three, Genesis chapter one. That should be an easy one for us to find. Verse 11, he says, Then God said, this is the third day, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. What's he saying? He says the seed is in its kind. There is a kind of Adam, and there is a kind of the second Adam. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit whose need is in itself, seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, so the evening and the morning were the third day. He rose from the dead according to the scriptures. And this points us to the fact that he is the first fruit over the new creation. We should rejoice in the work that was prophesied, that was pointed to from the beginning, but that we have now known in Christ. That we don't simply have the fruit or the seed of Adam, but now as we've entered into the new Adam, we have his seed, which is victory over death. The resurrection in our lives. This whole season, we rejoice and we celebrate in the power of of the resurrection in our lives. We rejoice because we have hope. We don't have to sedate ourselves with the world, trying to make sense of an empty life. But we have power and we trample over the tombs. The assurance of eternal life and the victory over death is one that we can celebrate because of Christ's own resurrection. And so we greet one another, Christ is risen. I know this is sensitive to some people, but when, um, when a person departs, one of the most beautiful ways that you can greet the family of someone who has lost a loved one is to remind them of the hope that we have in the resurrection to greet them, Christ is risen. I was very grateful, actually, when my father passed away that I received numerous phone calls from, from dear friends and hello, and they would immediately say, Christ is risen. Christ is risen. And that is the hope that we have. That's the, the victory that we have. And we can rejoice in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We also rejoice in his ascension and his intercession. Hebrews 7.25 says, Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Think about that in Christ, where is, where is Christ seated at this point? 
the right hand of the Father. Which means you who are in Christ are able to experience the beauty of heaven at the right hand of the Father. And it's from that place that he intercedes for us as we continue to struggle through this world, yet tasting a glimpse of heaven in our forerunner who went before us to prepare a place with us. In the book of Revelation, it's one of the, the I think it's the second or third church. There's the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3 where he says that he will give to the one who overcomes a place to sit at the right hand. That's his place. And he invites us into that place that has been secured and prepared for us. How we should rejoice in knowing that Jesus intercedes for us and he has gone to prepare a place for us that we can enjoy a little taste of while we're here. And of course, we rejoice in the ultimate fulfillment of Christ's return. Revelation chapter 22, the final chapter of the Bible, says, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Consider the promise and anticipation of Christ's return. You know, in, in the very last chapter of 1 Corinthians, St. Paul Many of you know this, this phrase in Greek. He is anticipating the return of Christ, and he says, anyone? Starts with M. Mar, Maranatha. Come, Lord. Maranatha. There's this deep anticipation and hope that St. Paul has in the return of Christ. The ultimate fulfillment of all that is good of his work and our eternal joy as we rest in Christ for eternity. Rejoicing in the hope of his return, knowing that he is good. That the good guy, not the good guys, well, the good guy and the rest of his family, they do win. There is victory. There is life eternal in him. And so it's beautiful, it's important that we rejoice in the work of Christ. But it's also, I want to say, necessary for us to rejoice daily in the completed and ongoing work of Christ. I just want to quickly recap the points and then we'll close in prayer. Each day I want to encourage you to reflect on each aspect of Christ's work through this coming week. With the incarnation, embrace the humility of Christ in your own life and find joy there. With his crucifixion, live a life of gratitude for what he has done and a life of righteousness and rejoice in his work there. With his resurrection, live with boldness and hope and rejoice that you may because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. With his ascension, approach God with confidence in prayer that he hears you and that our Lord is interceding for you and rejoice that he is there preparing a place for you. And with his ultimate return, live with an eternal perspective, focusing on what truly matters. We oftentimes spend a lot of our time chasing after the cares of this world, chasing after wealth, degrees, chasing after bigger homes, chasing after positions of prestige and influence. And I think if there's one thing that we can truly learn to rejoice in is that we find perspective in what really matters in life. That the whole of our life rests, the joy of our life rests, the purpose of our life rests in the person of Jesus Christ. And when we go to him and we rest in him, then we will find joy. Then those other things that we do and fulfill and accomplish, then they will begin to find purpose. Then even those things can point to you the beauty of Christ's joyous work in your life, even in the mundane things that you do as you go about your day and do work.
and parents and go around in your marriages and the jobs that you do in your service to the Lord, even in those things, yes, then you will find joy. Let's rejoice in his work and seek to rejoice in him daily. All glory be to God forever. Amen. Let's pray.